right. Well, thank you all uh, so much for joining us at the sixth annual Puri Lecture. Um, and I want to start off with, um, with a concept or an idea that um, uh, I think is really important for where we are right now, and that is what unifies us is not separation. And uh, the meaning of this gift and endowment by the Puri family was initially intended to bring together and unify us in a way that has not existed for the lymphoma program uh, here at Emory for a long time. Uh, but I think it takes on a greater meaning in this year when we are all separate. Um, and that's one of the challenges I think we've all struggled with in the last year, the idea of how do we unify when we have been separate. Uh, and fortunately, we can hopefully see some light at the end of that tunnel uh, and uh, the ability to come back and, and be around each other to bring our colleagues together. But to another level, I think that this opportunity uh, through the incredible generosity of the Puri family allows us to unify and break down walls of science, research, and collaboration. And we do it with the intent of solving problems uh, and uh, moving forward better than we were in previous years. And this brings us to the sixth lecture. Uh, and Dr. Cohen will introduce our, our speaker. Uh, but uh, we are so fortunate that each year has been better than the past. Each year has grown this program. Each year has really helped to unify the Emory Lymphoma Program with the global lymphoma world. And that is such a unique opportunity. And this opportunity would not have been possible without the kind of support and, uh, both, uh, uh, and uh, both financial and otherwise from the Puri family. So we are so grateful for all that you all have done for us. And we look forward to a really no another really amazing lecture from us today. I want to leave you uh, again with this theme of unity uh, with uh, a quote that I'm sure that, uh, that Puri's would, would, will appreciate to the extent that my family does as well. And that is the significance which is in unity is an eternal wonder. And that was by the, 2013, uh, the uh, 1913 Nobel laureate uh, Rabindranath Tagore. Uh, and those words ring true now. Uh, the power in unity is an eternal wonder, and we are grateful for the ability to come together for this reason today and continue that legacy going forward. Uh, so with that, I think um, I introduce Dr. Puri, who's going to make the next set of comments, and we go from there. Dr. Puri? Thank you, Dr. 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 Loniel. Uh, I have to follow your eloquent words, and I feel very anxious as it is with this whole setup. I'm an old school, so... <laughs> Uh, the, the, the technology still makes me nervous, but I want to welcome everybody to the sixth annual Surandapuri Memorial Lecture. And I'm delighted that Dr. Carrie Savage is our speaker and she will be speaking to us from British Columbia, uh, which, is, uh, which is really marvelous. Uh, I, I wanted to say, you know, follow up with the, what Dr. Loniel said, the chaos of COVID pandemic made me very anxious and I kept thinking, oh gee, how are we going to do this lecture? And uh, of course, thanks to Barbara, Jennifer, Julie, their collective talents, uh, we do have a lecture irrespective of the fact that we are all not together in Atlanta, but hopefully next year we will be. Uh, in so I am, I'm Rudula Puri, by the way, I'm Saranda Puri's wife. And today is his birthday, and he would have been 83 years young. And uh, we, this is a good way to celebrate his birthday. In some ways, this whole thing, and I really, very symbolic, I think of surrender, the person we honor today, because in the midst of chaos of mental cell lymphoma, abrupt diagnosis, a long treatment, remissions, relapses, he always kept his ideology that the show of life must go on. And he did that by continuing to do what he wanted to do in life, in his profession, with his family, travels, his hobbies. He did not let the adversity get in the way. And so to me, the lecture is very symbolic that COVID or no COVID, we are still all here and having a lecture by, by, by 
very uh, distinguished speaker today. Uh, Surrender uh, did a lot. He gave a lot of joy, love, a lot of uh, fun to his family. And uh, he always believed, you know, I, I tend to, I'm a psychiatrist, but I, I would be bemoaning and saying, oh gee, you know, because of COVID, oh, we don't have a lecture in person. And I could just hear Surrender say, isn't that wonderful that we can do this? Technology is amazing. And that was the person that Surrender was. I am extremely grateful and thankful to Winship and especially Dr. Loniel who treated Surrender with uh, the best treatment available at the time. And we as a family uh, in, in honoring surrender and giving a lot of thanks to the Winship team uh, created this lecture with our mission being, we bring the best researchers to Winship to share the latest research trends and treatment and uh, collaborate with our researchers here and also use technology, di digital technology to spread the word far and near in the world. So I, with that, I would thank uh, Barbara, Julie, and Jennifer again. And I would like to welcome Dr. Savage uh, to this sixth uh, Memorial Lecture. Thank you. I just wanted to uh, also uh, welcome Dr. Savage and take a moment to thank the Puri family, uh, Dr. Puri uh, and, and family. It, the generosity that you've shown towards our lymphoma program has really directly led to the growth of our program over the last several years. Uh, there are ongoing collaborations with each of our prior speakers, uh, which were not in place uh, prior to uh, them coming on campus. Uh, and in fact, uh, this past year, Dr. Victor Orellana Noya joined us from the University of Virginia, uh, where he had been mentored by one of our prior speakers, Dr. Mike Williams. Uh, and that ongoing relationship, I think, was one of the key factors that helped um, propel us uh, to be able to successfully recruit uh, Victor down here, and he's already off to a fantastic start. Uh, so uh, with that, it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Carrie Savage, uh, who comes to us uh, from British Columbia. Uh, I think if there is a silver lining to all of the uh, chaos going on is that it makes, a, um, makes uh, having Dr. Savage speak uh, a little bit easier instead of her having to travel quite so far. Uh, and so we're uh, thankful that she's been able uh, to join us today and looking forward to some additional uh, opportunities for her to meet with our faculty uh, at the conclusion of, of today's talk and, and throughout the afternoon. Uh, Dr. Savage, as I said, comes from BC Cancer. Uh, she previously had done training in London, Ontario, uh, as well as in Boston, where she did some additional training in lymphoma, as well as in epidemiology. Uh, she is has has been uh, a key uh, figure in, a, in the research of a number of aspects of lymphoma, both B and T cell lymphoma. I frequently cite her work in my own work as she was one of the first to identify uh, the negative impact of MIC rearrangement in, in lymphoma and has also uh, contributed greatly uh, to uh, the field in, uh, as far as her work on CNS, uh, predicting CNS relapse as well as in T cell lymphoma. Uh, so today she'll be talking about peripheral T-cell lymphomas, recent advances in future directions. And prior to her getting started, just a, a little bit of housekeeping, if everyone could please keep themselves muted throughout the talk. Uh, at the end of the talk, there will be a question and answer uh, period. Please do put your um, uh, question into the chat uh, and then Dr. Savage will have a chance to respond. And certainly if you want to follow up to her response, you can then unmute and speak up. Uh, but with that, uh, I am, uh, pleased to introduce Dr. Kerry Savage uh, and looking forward to your talk. Thanks again. Thank you so much, uh, Jonathan. I'm just going to make sure I can share my screen and get my title slide up for just one moment. Um, can you all see and hear me? <laughs> we have a check. Excellent. Yeah, thank you again for the kind introduction invitation. I thank the Puri family for um, launching this. Honestly, I, I'm quite um, humbled and honored to be invited uh, to speak at the Prairie Lecture. Um, it's it's kind of neat that it's back on his birthday again. I understand the first one I think was also on his birthday. Um, I also, I have to admit, I feel a little bit of the imposter syndrome if I, as I look at the, the list of prior speakers um, and to hear they get better and better. I hope I can hold that up today. Um, so I, as you met, as mentioned, I'm from uh, Vancouver, British Columbia. Uh, this is a picture of 
Vancouver. Uh, honestly, you can't beat it on a sunny day. If you haven't been there, I highly recommend it. UBC is out to the west and BC Cancer is out to the east. I can't say that this is my, the view I have my office. I actually look out to a cement pillar, but if any of you ever come, please look me up. I'll set you up with an itinerary. Um, I was given free reign on the topic today, um, and it was actually hard because there's a lot of different lymphoma talk, talk, um, topics that I'm passionate about. But I went back to my research beginnings, peripheral T cell lymphomas, and I also think it shares some similarities with mantle cell lymphoma um, in that it's a bit of a black sheep. You know, a lot of the dominant research has been in the more common uh, lymphomas like diffuse large B cell lymphoma and follicular lymphoma. And it's an excellent example of collaboration um, in a rare disease. You, you can't move forward unless you're collaborating. And I adjusted my title a little bit to past, present, and future because I want to pay homage uh, to the past, uh, particularly the hematopathologists that organized our classification um, so that we can understand these diseases today. So here are my uh, disclosures. I just mentioned I'm going to be talking about the off-label use of number of drugs in the context of some recent data and clinical trials in peripheral T cell lymphomas. So by way of introduction, peripheral T cell lymphomas are derived from post-thymic T cells, and they're otherwise called mature uh, T cell and NK neoplasms. And this is to differentiate them from the precursor uh, lesions, uh, lymphoblastic lymphoma or TALL. So this is just a, a schema of the evolution of classification. And, and I, in the interest of time, I'm not gonna go through it, but I do wanna just let you know that uh, we really did have a breakthrough in lymphoma classification, including in peripheral T cell lymphomas with the real classification uh, developed by a group of hematopathologists from Europe and, and uh, North America from the International Lymphoma Study Group. Um, prior to this, there, everybody was using their own classification system um, and we weren't talking the same language. And in North America, they, they weren't even integrating T cell lymphomas. And this is the first time we saw division of T cell lymphomas into precursor T cell uh, neoplasms and peripheral uh, NK and T cell neoplasms of what we call them today. This led the basis uh, for the updated WHO in uh, 2001, and most recently it was updated in 2016. So this is uh, the latest, I'll call it laundry list of uh, peripheral T cell lymphoma subtypes uh, in the last update of the WHO. So there's over 30 different subtypes. So a lot of people find managing peripheral T cell lymphomas intimidating because they are there are so many different diseases and we do really need to think about them all differently. Again, in the interest of time, I, I had to focus so, and I'm gonna concentrate on the so-called nodal PTCL subtypes peripheral T cell lymphoma not otherwise specified, angiomenoblastic T cell lymphoma and other nodal lymphomas of TFH or T follicular helper origin and systemic anaplastic large cell lymphoma or ALCL, which collectively represent 60% of all PTCLs in uh, Western populations. So there's been many challenges we faced in, in understanding the biology and improving outcomes in peripheral T cell lymphomas. So they're rare in, in North America, representing only about 10 or most 15% of all non-Hodgkin's lymphomas. Um, our favorite word in PTCLs is heterogeneous. And as I've already shown, there's over 30 different subtypes. The diagnosis and classification is challenging. It really does require uh, expert hematopathology review. And then we've had constant refinement in, of lymphoma classification, which has been a good thing. So we better understand and manage the disease, but it's also obviously made it more complicated. Um, a lot of the studies have included all subtypes, so um, you, you lose a little bit in trying to understand benefits of different treatments, but we are learning that um, different subtypes have different drug sensitivities. And by default, um, treatment paradigms have been borrowed from diffuse large B cell lymphoma, so, and there's very few randomized control studies. Uh, as a result, CHOP is considered the standard, and it's also been the backbone on which we've added new agents. Uh, but it's clear that one size fits all, all does not uh, work in peripheral T cell lymphomas. So like, again, I'm um, going back to my research beginning. So this was uh, a study I actually did as a fellow um, where we described the outcome of peripheral T cell lymphomas by the WHO classification, North America. This may seem a little lowbrow um, today, 
uh, believe it or not, it was selected for an oral presentation at, at ASH. Um, and uh, it, it led to a, a large uh, collaboration with Julie Bose and the International T-Cell Lymphoma Project. Um, so that was a, a project of over a thousand uh, cases from around the world. And the real strength of that study is that they had central pathology review. I've also shown here a study from the Swedish uh, registry, also just to highlight um, the, the poor outcome that we see, um, particularly in NOS and angioinoblastic T-cell lymphoma, where the five-year PFS is only in about 20 to 30%. Um, patients with ELK negative ALCL do a little better, but you can see that there is a little bit of a discrepancy in outcome, and I'm going to come back to why uh, we see that in studies in just a minute. And then patients with ELK positive ALCL tend to do better, and their outcome is considered similar to diffuse large B-cell lymphoma. So starting with the systemic ALCL, and again, thinking about the uh, uh, history of it, um, the key one antigen was identified in 1985 and subsequently determined to be the CD30 uh, antigen on the surface receptor. Uh, this was followed by identification of the 2,5 translocation and subsequently uh, the genes identified in the fusion gene, uh, the fusion was an NPM and ELK, which results in ELK protein with tyrosine kinase activity. Um, in, in 2001, um, systemic and cutaneous ALCL were updated, uh, were separated in that update of the WHO, recognizing that cutaneous ALCL has an indolent um, behavior and then with identification of a, or development of an ELK1 antibody, there were a number of studies looking at prognosis of ELK positive and ELK negative ALCL. And actually the first study came out of our own institution by Randy Gascoigne um, and indicating that ELK positive ALCL patients do much better. But it wasn't until the update in uh, 2008 that ELK positive ALCL was actually defined as a distinct entity in the WHO. Uh, with ELK negative only a provisional entity, as it was more defined by what it wasn't by than what it was. This changed in the last update where ELK negative ALCL finally has its home as a distinct entity. This is in part by work by Andy Feldman and colleagues, uh, where they identified pre in previous study a recurrent rearrangement involving the DUS22 gene um, and then an uh, a small proportion of patients um, having a TP63 rearrangement. And then the large majority of ELK negative ALCL have so-called triple negative ALCL, where they lack any of the rearrangements. So in the study shown here, they looked at the prognostic impact of these uh, genetic rearrangements, and they compared the outcome uh, to patients with ELK positive ALCL. So thinking first about the DUS22 rearranged anaplastic large cell lymphoma, I just want to highlight a couple of key features. So across studies, it occurs in about 20 to 30% of all cases. Median age is a little younger than what we see with um, garden variety ELK negative ALCL. It's typified by abundant hallmark cells. So those are the cells with the horseshoe shaped nucleus that define ALCL. But it also has these so-called donut cells that I've shown in the inset. Um, because they look like donuts. Um, and they're typically cytotoxic uh, marker and EMA negative. So again, they looked at the outcome uh, of these groups. And interestingly, cases that harbored a DUS22 rearrangement had a five-year overall survival of 90%. So it was similar to what we see with L-positive ALCL. On the other end of the spectrum are um, cases with a TP63 rearrangement, although rare. They have a dismal outcome. And then the, the large majority fall into that triple negative category with, with an intermediate prognosis. But you can en envision that if you have different proportions of these different uh, subtypes in clinical studies, you're going to see disparate prognoses uh, across studies. So it's really important that we, that we ad uh, ad identify these different uh, subgroups in studies today. So there's been a few studies of uh, validating, um, trying to validate the prognostic importance of DUS22 rearrangement. Um, the first thing to note is that these studies are small. This is a rare disease, and now we're looking for a rare subtype within a rare disease. But the, the first two did show that the um, survival, so this is overall survival, was similar to what you would see with L-positive ALCL. Um, we actually did this uh, largest validation cohort at BC Cancer, 
Um, and I, quite surprisingly, we actually found that some cases of DUST-22 rearrangement did poorly. We even had a patient who had a CNS relapse. Um, I, I, but we also had others that did very well. But I think at, at the end of the day, my, my take home is there's no question this is a genetically distinct disease that's typically associated with a favorable course, but I think we need larger studies to really fully uh, appreciate the disease spectrum. I do think of it as similar to L positive ALCL where not all patients do well. We've all had patients with high risk L positive ALCL, CNS relapse, and there's, there's likely some other genetic um, changes that are layered upon it. But I do think it's important um, to collect this information and DUST-22 and P63 rearrangements can be identified by FISH analysis and, and should be performed in all newly diagnosed cases. Shifting to angiomenoblastic uh, T-cell lymphoma. Um, so there's some very unique, uh, both pathologic and clinical features. Um, I'm not a hematopathologist, uh, but I, I appreciate the, uh, the beauty of this. This, is, this first panel just shows arborizing venules. Um, these are expanded FTC networks that are CD21 positive. The tumors are CD3 positive and surrounding immunoblast B cells are CD20 positive. And these are the cells that uh, are positive for Epstein-Barr virus. Um, clinically, we uh, see some unique features. Uh, patients often have rash, rashes, they're itchy, uh, polyclonal hyperglobulinemia, autoimmune manifestations can occur. Um, and there is an inherent immunosuppression and uh, increased infection risk. And those B cell immunoblasts can develop into B cell lymphomas, including diffuse large B cell lymphomas. So the last update of the WHO has expanded um, this category. So there's now also other nodal lymphomas of TFH origin. In order to be diagnosed in this category, the uh, tumors have to be CD4 positive and positive for at least two of these markers. This definition was largely arbitrary. Um, and so I think we don't really know what, what if somebody has one TFH marker? What is the biology of that? So I, I think uh, we're, we're still trying to understand um, that category, but suffice it to say, they should all be sort of considered together with angiomenoblastic T cell lymphoma. Um, if you're looking at older studies, these TFH PTCLs would have been just lumped in with PTCL NOS. There have not, now been a number of studies uh, looking at the mutational landscape of angiomenoblastic T cell lymphoma and more recently in TFH PTCL. And there are some recurrent mutations and epigenetic modifiers as shown here. And we are, we are seeing emerging data of specific drug sensitivity um, to angiomenoblastic, in angiomenoblastic T cell lymphoma, uh, HDAC inhibitors, hypomethylating agents, and EZH2 inhibitors. I'm gonna talk about that in more detail as I uh, get into therapy. So moving to the so-called wastebasket diagnosis, PTCL NOS. So uh, lymphomas end up in this category if they can't, if the pathologist can't fit them into one of the specified uh, categories. So it's been long recognized that this is a heterogeneous group and we've been waiting for a meaningful way to separate them. And I think the closest we've come is from work from uh, Javid Iqbal and colleagues at the LMPP, um, where by molecular uh, classification, they identified two dominant cl clusters, one termed cluster one with expression of GATA3 in downstream targets, and one cluster two. You're muted, Dr. Savage. Oh my gosh, the whole time? No, 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 no. I see. <laughs> You're, no, you're fine now. I can hear you. Told me, right? I hear you now. Go right ahead. That is strange. Oh, I okay. Know. I have a gremlin in here. I didn't touch any mute buttons. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So a cluster two uh, was typified by TBX21 and, um, and downstream targets. They had some uh, outcome correlation in the study, and they did find that GATA3 cases had an inferior survival compared to those with TBX21. Importantly, 20% still remain unclassifiable. Um, so we still have some work to do to, to fully understand um, the disease spectrum. And although it is a little bit of hand-waving, if you look at the uh, gene signatures, there's a hint there that maybe these uh, patients have fallen to diff these different clusters might um, have sensitivity to different drugs. 
Um, I'll just let you know that there is an immunohistochemical algorithm uh, that largely recapitulates this, uh, the gene uh, signature um, that incorporates also CCR4 and CXCR3, the uh, targets of uh, TBX21 and GATA3. Um, we are still waiting large validation studies as well as a reproducible RNA signature that we can apply in clinical practice and in clinical trials. Um, this may not be the whole story. I just want to uh, highlight another uh, study from the Japanese group. Um, we don't have large scale whole exome sequencing studies in NOS. I think likely in the next couple of years, we'll be seeing data for this. So there's been some limited uh, studies looking at uh, targeted panels, but this group um, found that uh, by applying a targeted panel, the patients fell into three different groups. One actually was a TFH group. I would argue that that sh probably shouldn't be in this study because we're focusing on the non-TFH, but they did find that there were two other groups and one of which was typified by TP53 mutations in, and CD, uh, CDK and two-way. And then one uh, termed other, which was slightly unsatisfying, but there was no particular pattern. I think the other group actually is the most interesting because they seem to have an excellent outcome, although these numbers are small. Um, within this study, they also looked at GATA3 and TBX21 expression by RNA and protein um, and did not find they clustered into these groups. But we do know that these are not reliable as sole markers. You have to look at the, the, the signature and certainly there can be low level of GATA3 expression in TBX21 cases. So I'm gonna shift now to the last part of my talk talking about therapy and, and what are, what are strategies we've, we've used to improve upon CHOP and where is the field going? Um, this is an ex example of some of the things that have been done in the past. One is to add a top aside. Um, the other is to build a new backbone and the other is to add consolidated transplant. Um, I'm gonna talk about show up um, and consolidated transplant in upcoming slides. So I'll just I'll focus on building a new back, uh, backbone. Um, so this is, uh, actually this is a bandwagon I got on it. Um, 10 to 15 years ago, uh, being quite frustrated with CHOP and recognizing that CHOP was used really as a default. Uh, and there was data to support that gemcitabine was active as a single agent in, in PTCL. So that launched a few studies actually looking at new gemcitabine combinations. Unfortunately, they were a bit of a bust. Um, we had uh, the UK uh, study with a randomized phase two study comparing gem P with CHOP um, and uh, there was no outcome difference. And the SWOG study also actually had a, a very poor outcome. Um, this might speak to the importance of alkylators. So we're missing cyclophosphamide. Um, we are also missing anthracyclines. I don't know if that's as important. We've had mixed studies on that. Some would actually say that it's not as not important, but at the end of the day, uh, this is not something that's gonna move forward. What about show up? Um, so that's that's actually in the NCCN guidelines as a as an option. Where did where did that data come from? It was actually a study published over ten years ago from the German high grade study group, where they um, took patients with T cell lymphoma that had been enrolled on prospective uh, uh, high grade studies, and then asked a number of questions. One of which was, if you have a topocyte in your frontline regimen is there an improved uh, event-free survival? And the answer was yes, if you pooled all of uh, the PTCL cases. Um, keeping in mind this, this, this was a, a selected group based on the trial el eligibility. They were young and they had a normal, normal LDH. But when you uh, pull out the L-positive ALCLs, they're actually the ones that seem to have the most benefit from a top aside. And for the other category, didn't quite read statistical significance, but there is a trend in the right direction with the addition of a top aside. There were some caveats to this analysis. It wasn't uh, not adjusted for prognostic factors and they didn't see an overall survival benefit. Um, but there have been a couple of other subsequent studies to support um, in, that the addition of a top aside may improve progression-free or event-free survival in younger patients. So really the cutoff is about 60 because this does add additional toxicity. So that's why it's kind of settled as an option, but we don't have level A evidence. Um, what about consolidative transplant? Well, to be honest, this could have actually filled up a whole um, hour of talk and it's very controversial, um, but I'll just mention a couple of things. I have a 
few cautionary notes just about interpreting the data. Um, again, we don't have randomized control studies because of disease rarity. Um, I could show you re retrospective evidence for and against transplant. And there's very few prospective studies. And of course, because of disease rarity, all of the subtypes are thrown in there. Having said that, because the relapse rate remains high with CHOP, even, a, even in a complete remission, so a complete remission is not as reliable in peripheral T cell lymphomas, it is considered in most subtypes and across guidelines, um, you'll see it, uh, that wording consideration should be given to, for transplant with the exception of ELK positive ALCL, um, where we would just give chemotherapy alone. The largest prospective study is from the Nordic group, um, the NLG2, T01 that uh, enrolled 160 newly diagnosed patients with peripheral T cell lymphoma. The largest uh, uh, proportion of patients had NOS. Taken together, the five-year progression-free survival was 44%, so a little better than what you would expect. And although not statistically significant, um, looking at outcome by subtype, ELK negative uh, ALCL and angiomyoplastic T cell lymphoma seem to float to the top of the list, although the ELK negative ALCL patients were young um, and good performance status. I think I was most impressed with angiomyoplastic. This is better than I would expect. So at the end of the day, this is, I think, better than historical. It's certainly not a home run. Um, and you have to keep in mind, this is still a highly selected trial population. And it's probably a small percentage that benefit from that dose intensity. And of course, we can't figure out which ones those, those are. And, and we need better upfront therapy and then we wouldn't need the transplant. So how, how can we replace CHOP and, and uh, what has the rocky road been to get there? The most appro popular approach has been to add a novel agent. And I can tell you there's been a number of phase two studies and a, um, and a minority of phase three studies that have uh, attempted to approve upon CHOP and they've, they've uh, been negative. I'll talk about the phase three studies in just a minute. There are some studies that are still a work in progress and I'll talk a little bit about CHOP and, and 5AZA. And then we do recently have something that has moved the therapeutic bar, um, the combination of CHIP and brentuxavadotin and I'll talk about that in a moment. So what hasn't worked? Um, well, these are two studies that, uh, that we've seen published recently. So the uh, ACT2 was uh, from the German group and it enrolled older patients to either CHOP14, so just a two week regimen, or CHOP14 and alumtuzumab. Um, and as you can see here, this was a negative study. They had a companion study called ACT1 in younger patients, uh, looking at show up with or without alumtuzumab, as well as autologous stem cell transplant. That hasn't been published yet, but it was uh, presented at ASH and was also a negative study. At ASH this year, we heard about the uh, chop Romy study, um, and unfortunately that one was also negative. Um, what did we learn? I mean, I would argue also we, we learned that we can do phase three studies in PTCLs, so that's one good thing. Uh, we also learned it's not easy to combine drug, drugs with CHOP, so both of these studies had associated increased toxicity, especially with the addition of alumtuzumab, and then we have ongoing challenges with disease heterogeneity, and I'll, I'll come back to that in a moment. Um, in terms of our benchmark for CHOP, it's not very high uh, for, the, for the standard arm, the three-year PFS of only 35%. So what do we need to do? We need to pick the right agent and we need to pick the right disease. So it, there was a, a success with TET-BV and CD30 positive PTCLs. So where did, and I think people are familiar with this, I'll go over this briefly. Um, Brintuximabidotin is an antibody drug conjugate directed against CD30. It's a microtubulin inhibitor and ultimately interferes with my mitosis. Um, anaplastic large cell lymphoma by definition is wall-to-wall -wall CD30 positive. So Brintuximabidotin was developed in, um, in parallel in relapse refractory ALCL and Hodgkin's lymphoma. So I've shown here the waterfall plot from the original registration study and you can see the response rate is high, it was 86%, with over half achieving a complete remission. Shown here, the updated five-year follow-up with PFS curve. Um, and what's in also interesting within that study, there was a small number of patients who got brentuximab, vedotin alone without transplant and remain in complete remission over five years later. So there are some patients that actually cured with this single agent. And that was also true in the Hodgkin's lymphoma trial. 
So moving forward, it was combined with uh, BV in this phase one study. Um, so, so the majority of patients had L-negative ALCL. Interestingly, none of the patients had received a consolidated transplant. And the five-year PFS was 52%. So again, better than what you would expect uh, historically. So this led to the rationale for Echelon 2. There's a double-blind, double-dummy study comparing CHEP-BV to CHOP. Um, as a reminder, uh, patients had to have their tumor CD30 positive with a, uh, by local laboratory with a 10% cutoff. Um, and the study also targeted to enroll 75% um, of patients with systemic ALCL. And that was due to a regulatory requirement in both Europe and in Health, Can in Health Canada, um, as this was meant to be a confirmatory trial for their original single agent approval. The primary endpoint was progression-free survival as shown here. So this is uh, different than the endpoint for um, Echelon 1, which was a modified uh, PFS. And this was also by central review. And events did not include consolidated radiotherapy or, or stem cell transplant. So physicians could decide whether they wanted to consolidate with these uh, other treatments. These are baseline characteristics. And this, was, this is just to highlight, again, that a uh, large portion had ALCL. So it ended up being 70% of patients. If you look at the, the next two most common, NOS and angioblastic T cell lymphoma, there's only anywhere from 25 to 40 patients in each arm. So it becomes more difficult to assess out the benefit of this regimen in, in those non-ALCL subtypes. Um, so this study did show an improved progression-free as well as overall survival. So it was the first study to ever show improved overall survival. We saw an over doubling of the median PFS and the three-year PFS of 57% versus 44%. At ASH last year, the um, fo uh, follow-up is now almost four years and the five-year PFS is settled at 51.4% with the comparator arm of 43%. Um, you might remember in those uh, the uh, ACT-1 study and the romy Depson study, the, the, the three-year PFS and EFS was 35%, so it's a little better in this study given the enrichment for ALCL. Uh, shown here is the forest plot, and again, just to highlight one point, is the uh, hazard ratios by um, histologic subtype. Um, so that because the numbers are small, the, the confident intervals are wide, and you certainly have less certainty, specific, particularly for angioimmunoblastic T cell lymphoma, where it's falling on the, the other um, side of the hazard ratio line. So this has led to some differences in regulatory approval of, of CHEP-BB um, around the world. So I just wanted to let you know what's happening outside of the U.S. So you're always quickest in the U.S. So this actually... Um, I'm told was the fastest FDA approval ever. It was two weeks, knowing that this really was a, a desperate unmet need. And the eligibility was um, similar to the intention to treat population. Uh, we were later in Health Canada um, and had some restriction to the three most common subtypes. Um, we actually in, in uh, BC just got funding um, last December. So unlike in the US where you can start using medications immediately, we have to go through our system in a public uh, health care. Uh, so that, that's always a bit frustrating when we see data like this. And then in Europe, they restricted it right down to uh, systemic ALCL um, because of the, the uh, minority of patients with the other subtypes. Um, one question we had is, well, can, if we have this better upfront for therapy, do we really need consolidated transplant after? Um, this was presented uh, at, at ASH in 2019. Um, so we took patients who were in a complete remission at the end of their treatment, and then just compared those who had consolidated transplant versus the, those that didn't, excluding those with L-positive ALCL. And, it, um, and much to my disappointment, <laughs> Uh, PFS did appear still better with consolidative transplant. So we could not use this data to say, yeah, if you use CHEP-BV, you don't need a transplant. Um, I do think there still are subgroups that don't need a transplant. And I can tell you, I had two patients uh, with L-negative ALCL that went into Echelon 2, neither of which I transplanted, and they're still in remission over five years later. Um, but we need to, better ways probably of selecting them. So shifting to relapse refractory peripheral T cell lymphomas, just some things that uh, we think about in uh, selecting therapy. 
the first question is whether somebody is a transplant candidate, um, what, what approved drugs are available, and then can we start to use uh, biology to make uh, treatment choices? So I just have one slide on um, allogeneic transplants. So in, you know, a lot of these patients have had upfront auto, so this may not be an option um, unless they're late relapses and, and then perhaps a reduced intensity conditioning allo could be considered. Um, but it, I think it's, it really does have a role in some patients. And this was a retrospective series that was presented by Neha Mehta Shaw at ASH last year. It's over 500 patients. Um, and the two-year PFS uh, was almost 46%. Um, we see angiomenoblastic T-cell lymphoma at the top of the list. And I've seen other studies to support a good outcome in, with that particular entity. And prior studies have supported um, evidence of a grass versus lymphoma effect um, as demonstrated by responses to donor lymphocyte infusion. So this is an option to think about for some patients. But for, for many, it's not an option or uh, you know, they've, they've relapsed early after auto and we're looking at really a non-curative situation. So what, a, what drugs are approved uh, for peripheral T-cell lymphomas? Uh, once again, the FDA is much more generous <laughs> with their approvals uh, than uh, the rest of the world and get things quickly. And you can see that not everything is approved everywhere. So why, uh, why are the other jurisdictions stingy? Well, the problem is these are phase two studies and we don't, we don't have a comparator. So it becomes more difficult um, to get them through the system. Um, this is particularly true if we have modest response rates. So uh, with the exception of Brentoximab Medotin, the response rate with these agents is about 25 to 30%. Um, the median PFS is usually about three to four months, but there's no question that we do see some uh, meaningful durable responses with, with some of these agents in some patients. So I'm going to shift back to more customized treatment um, with relapse refractory peripheral T-cell lymphomas. And I consider these TFH PTCLs the poster child for this concept. Um, so HDAC inhibitors are really one of the early agents explored in peripheral T-cell lymphomas. And there were three uh, that have had phase two studies. Kytomide was developed in uh, China. And then the Romidepsin and Bolinistat are available in the US. Um, Again, just to pull out angiomenoblastic T-cell lymphoma, there's a hint here that the responses uh, may be higher. Um, but importantly, there, there are some patients who have very durable responses. So this is an update from the original registration study of Romidepsin and uh, relapse refractory peripheral T-cell lymphomas. And although the response rate was actually quite comparable to all PTCLs, they had um, the in the patients who responded, the median duration of response had, was not reached. And they have a few, a small percentage of patients who remain in complete remissions over three years. And I've certainly seen this in my, my own practice. Uh, um, this definitely compares favorably to what you would expect with chemotherapy. This was just published uh, last year, uh, similar, um, similar data. They did a larger series of 127 patients um, with HDAC inhibitors or HDAC inhibitor in combinations, comparing response in patients with TFH PTCL versus non PTTH. Um, and as you can see, the response rates are higher um, with the TFH, uh, maybe, and maybe slightly higher complete remissions with combinations. Um, although the median duration of response um, and median PFS was not better with TFH they are sorry, compared to non-TFH, it becomes difficult when we're, uh, for two reasons. One, some of these patients went off to have allo transplant. And two, um, the curves get a bit unstable with the small, with small numbers. Uh, within this study, they, had, they looked at the mutational profile using their own uh, targeted sequencing panel for, and they had information on 28 patients. And not surprisingly, most of the responders had TFH PTCL, but not all. So four out of them actually had PTCL NOS. Um, so layered up upon this, they looked at um, which mutations might be associated with response and found that mutations in typical uh, or, or typical a AITL mutations were associated resp with response. And they did have one case of PTCL NOS with a TAT2 mutation that had a complete remission. So my take home from this is um, I think the TFH 
PTCL subtype is uh, important in thinking about um, response to HDAC inhibitors, but there might be also more to it. And we might need to also look at mutational profile um, even beyond these typical um, mutations, perhaps in all epigenetic uh, modifiers. Beyond HDAC inhibitors, we're seeing some really uh, impressive results with the hypomethylating agents, uh, 5-AZA. And there is, again, that, a rationale there. We do see recurrent mutations and genes involved in methylation in this subtype. Um, so this study uh, uh, showed, uh, it was only 12 patients, but the response rate was 75% with half achieving complete remission and a median PFS of, of, of 15 months. Um, you know, although this is small numbers, this is encouraging. And this has actually launched um, a couple of studies looking um, at 5-AZA AZA specifically in TFH PTCL. Um, and I'm, act I'm actually excited that people are attempting phase three studies um, so we can really move the field forward. And for, um, for Health Canada, maybe this will be something, I, if it's a positive study, a drug I could get. Um, both of these are against investigators' choice. Um, interestingly, they did allow Romy, so I, I think that, that that is stacking the bar a little bit, I think. Um, but uh, I think this will be really interesting data for us to watch out for. Um, there's a, a big movement uh, just to combine novel agents. We're trying to deepen that response rate. And there's, there's no question that um, increasing there's increasing complete remission when you add agents together. And I think the trick is going to be selecting the, the best combination and balancing that with toxicity. Um, this was data uh, published in blood, uh, Owen O'Connor and the Columbia group of a phase one study of 5-AZA and Romidepsin in uh, hematologic malignancies, but focusing on the T-cell lymphomas, they certainly saw uh, selectivity and sensitivity for T-cell lymphomas over non-T-cell lymphomas. They had three patients with androminoblastic T-cell lymphoma, and uh, all of which had 100% reduction in their tumor volume. I think one question, you know, we have a lot of different combinations and how do we pick them and how do we efficiently study them? Um, this was a slide kindly provided by Stephen Horowitz. And I think he's uh, done a, uh, or developed a really interesting trial design, a parallel phase one study. So with prior work with Divalistib showed a, a high response rate and a median PFS sitting at about eight months. So uh, a drug that does have activity of PTCLs and they wanted to combine it with both Romidepsin and Bortezomib to kind of pick the winner and would see, you know, what should we move forward with. Um, in this study, uh, the Romidepsin combination was the winner, into, both in terms of toxicity, but also in terms of efficacy. And again, with TFH uh, PTCLs having the highest response rate. The other thing they've done in collaboration with Dave Weinstock at Dana, the Dana Farber, they built in a, a, a rich. Um, collection of, cor of correlates so that they can understand who's benefiting and understand uh, uh, markers of resistance. Um, so I'm gonna, just gonna end with a bit of a debate that's emerging over uh, trial design and treatment naive peripheral T cell lymphoma. So uh, we've already talked about the uh, first approach of adding novel agent to CHP. And this is still the most popular approach, but there is, um, a movement um, going forward of abandoning CHOP altogether, given the poor outcomes, um, and replacing it with novel combinations in even in the treatment naive setting. So there's a little bit of data that's starting to emerge uh, around that. Um, so first, looping back to, to approach one, I want to go back to the CHOP Romy uh, study. Um, so this study was launched before we had uh, that update of the WHO in that broader TFH category. Um, but even outside of that, we had almost half the patients with angiomenoblastic T-cell lymphoma. So they represented the largest subtype here. Um, and you can kind of see that there is a, a hint here that the, these patients actually may be benefiting from, from trop -romy. What What if this study was actually just done in that TFH group? Would the outcome have been different? Would this actually uh, move that therapeutic bar? I'm, I'm suspicious that actually that would have been the case. Um, but there's also no question that the toxicity was greater. We, we saw a doubling of febrile neutropenia um, and 
for, uh, grade three, grade four, uh, thrombocytopenia occurred in 50% of patients. Um, another just a, a combination that's kind of moving forward is CHOP AZA. So I mentioned that earlier. And this was a study that was presented at ASH this year. Um, and they actually had an unplanned enrichment of TFH PTCLs. So you can see the eligibility criteria is quite broad when they launched the study. During the conduct of this study, Echelon 2 would have been reported. So of course, you're not going to enroll patients with ALCL. So at the end of the day, they ended up with mostly TFH PTCLs. Um, this study, um, the patients have a pre-phase with the, the oral azacitidine, which is also called CC486, in order to prime the cells for kill with the chemotherapy. Um, and it, there is built-in uh, growth factor support as well. Um, just to quickly highlight the toxicity before I show you the efficacy, um, again, we, we do see more, uh, more toxicity, um, but reassuringly, the febrile neutropenia rate was 14%. So, um, you know, with CHOP in the CHOP Romy study, it was 10%. So it's just a little bit higher. Um, and the thrombocytopenia um, was 10%. So that's a little bit better than what we saw with Romy. So the overall response rate um, was 75%, with CR rate of 75%. So that actually compares quite favorably, I would say, to um, just CHOP alone. Um, the follow-up short, so we're going to have to see where this goes. It's only just under a year and a half. And the one-year PFS is 66.1%. Um, they're building in correlatives here as well, and they found that cases with a TEP2 mutation had a better outcome, and those with a DNM T3A uh, had an adverse um, outcome, which we've also seen just with standard chemotherapy studies. Uh, so what, what uh, studies are planned or ongoing um, with approach one? Um, I found this in clinicaltrials.gov, so I just wanted to highlight it. This is a study out of China where they're actually using um, next generation sequencing and based on the sequencing, patients will be in different parallel cohorts. Uh, for example, if they have TP53 mutations, they'll get CHOP with decitabine, et cetera. Um, they also will have a CHOP arm, which I couldn't uh, discern is whether it's an actual randomization. And I didn't hear back from the uh, PI, so I can't update you on that. Um, in North America, you might hear about this Alliance study led by um, Dr. Meha Shah. Um, so this is a randomized phase two study. In, um, newly diagnosed CD30 negative. They're using that cutoff of 10%, um, you know, recognizing that those with 10% or more were entered into echelon two. And they're looking at two different experimental arms, one with uh, Devalisib and one with AZA. They're also allowing CHOAP. So they recognize that a lot of people do like to use CHOAP and they wanna have, explore that as a combination. Um, and then the standard arm is CHOP or CHOAP. So I think this is going to be sort of a, um, a, a first look at what, what combination should you move forward with. Um, there's a whole bunch of correlatives are also built in, into this. And I suspect they'll be looking at GATA3 and TBX21 to again, understand, you know, maybe there's different um, subgroups that benefit to different, different um, treatments. So what about approach two? Well, we don't have a lot of studies out there with combination normal uh, novel therapy in treatment naive um, peripheral T cell lymphomas um, for the reason that we only know that CHOP is, is, is curative. But there, there, as I mentioned, there have been a, a couple that have been launched. And this study was uh, actually just published a couple of weeks ago in blood. It was a phase two study out of Columbia. It was stopped early as uh, the PI moved institutions, um, but I want to focus on the treatment naive group. So there, there was only 11 patients. Um, most of them had TFH and geminoblastic T cell lymphoma. So I think investigators recognize that these drugs work in this subtype. So of course, you're going to be biased to enrolling them because that, that's what I would do if I had this study. And the CR rate uh, was 50% with an overall response rate of 70%. And I would say that is you know, comparing quite favorably to perhaps CHOP alone. Um, I would not say that this is uh, uh, toxicity free though, um, even though it's not chemotherapy, these novel agents can have uh, toxicity. 
So high grade thrombocytopenia in, in, in 48%. So that was sim similar to what we saw in Chopromi. Neutropenia in, in 50, 40%, but febrile neutropenia in 12%. So that's probably about the same as what um, of CHOP. Um, this is the overall survival curve. It's, uh, it's very early to be showing this. The median follow-up's only 13.5 months. Um, four of the patients in the treatment naive arm ended up getting consolidative transplant. So it might be a little bit hard to tease out, uh, you know, the, how much that impacted, but I think it'll be interesting to see longer follow-up of this. And, and the big question is obviously is, are the novel therapy combinations curative? Um, just to highlight, there are a couple of uh, studies that are falling on this sort of rationale. There's one from Northwestern looking at romidepsin and lenalidomide, so that's actually already going. They're specifically focusing on patients who are not eligible for chemo, so I guess probably the transplant ineligible and, and um, older patients. And then there's another one out of the NCI looking at a triplet combination that, interestingly, they're calling hard. So I don't hope that's not going to be a, a, a signal to the, the toxicity. Uh, and they have cohorts for uh, treatment naive and relapse refractory patients. So just to, to sum up, um, for primary therapy, uh, we, we talked about the um, shift in treatment paradigm with chet BV and CD30 positive PTCLs. We still have some questions here. Um, I didn't mention it, but the, all of the regulatory approvals were actually for CD30 positive any, although the trial was a cutoff of 10%. So we don't know that the benefit in those less than 10%. And I think um, there's going to be an ongoing debate um, of the right trial design. I think it'll be really interesting to see the long-term data of that, the novel therapy combinations. And then for relapse refractory disease, I, I do think the uh, the future is uh, the subtype specific um, trials, um, but also perhaps layered in the mutational profile because there are some that might not fit into that TFH category that could benefit from those same types of drugs. And then capitalizing on the, the right combination therapy and all of these trials, just uh, integration of those of the correlatives to really understand who's benefiting and, and resistant mechanisms. Thank you. Great, thanks so much, uh, Dr. Savage, for a, an outstanding talk. Uh, we do have a couple of minutes for questions, and then I know Dr. Puri would um, like to say a few words uh, to conclude at the end. Um, if you would like to go ahead and put your question in the chat, I will read it out just for those that are maybe called in through the phone so that they can hear it and then um, give you a chance to respond. Um, but while those are coming in, I actually have uh, a question, and so. Uh, I was very intrigued by the progress that's being made in you know, molecular subtyping for different PTCL subtypes. Uh, and it reminds me of some of the work that's been done in the large cell space. Um, unfortunately though, in large cell, other than perhaps maybe with double hit lymphomas, we've struggled to translate in, that into um, meaningful therapeutic decisions. And so in T cell lymphoma, where sometimes even finding the right pathologic subtype can be a challenge outside of specialized centers. Do, do you think that in the future, there will be a way forward with, with utilizing molecular subtyping to make treatment decisions, especially for untreated patients? Yeah, I, I do. I think we're, we're all, we've always been behind in peripheral T cell lymphomas. Um, that's been since the get go. Um, but, you know, Javid Iqbal is uh, working on nanostring um, signature to differentiate GATA3 and TBX21. So I, I think the future will be to integrate that information. Of course, at this point, um, it's similar to DLBC. We, would, we wouldn't know whether that would impact therapy. And usually you can't roll it out clinically until you have an action item that it's actually going to guide your, your therapy. But I, I feel that um, if we fast forward you know, into the future, we are going to see that and we're going to see routine probably mutation panels as well to, to help guide us. All right. Um, again, feel free to input your, your question. I guess while, while we're waiting, I guess one other question that, that I was just curious, sort of in your own practice, um, are you taking your um, first-line PTCL patients to transplant? I know you mentioned there were a few enrolled on the study um, that you didn't, but I was just curious what you're, what you're doing in your own practice. It's, a, it's an excellent question. I've, I've actually evolved as well. I, I did an ASH education session actually 10 years ago, and I, 
I actually had debate slides within my talk, <laughs> you know, right. for and against. And I, I'd say when we started here, we were not transplanting. After the Nordic study, although it's not a home run, I... I felt, you know, um, we should be offering it in NOS and, and angiomenoblastic T cell lymphoma. So we have in recent years been recommending consolidative transplant, I would say probably in the last six or seven years. Um, you know, the two patients that I had on Echelon 2, they were um, uh, ex um, extensive stage twos and I think lower risk IPI and one that was a little bit older. Um, and I, I just, I don't know, I just had a, my gut was that transplant was actually, was actually too much. And I think for elk negative, for most dust 22 rearranged cases, you, you don't need transplant. Um, I think there are low risk IPI patients that are fine with, especially now that we have CHET BV. The uncertainty I have is with NOS and angiomenoblastic T cell lymphoma. So those cases, I would still be offering consolidative transplant. Sure. Uh, Dr. Arachano would ask, um, are you aware of any potential markers for detecting minimal residual disease in, in the T cell lymphomas? Yeah, it's a good, it's a good question. You know, there's, there's a little bit of data emerging on circulating tumor DNA. I think there's, you, you know, you can look for the T cell receptor and, if, and with angiomenoblastic T cell lymphoma, you could actually look for the mutations. Um, so, but that's the, all the studies are very small. So they're not, I don't think this is prime time yet and it's still research, but uh, the, I know um, Dr. Mehta Shaw actually has a separate um, institutional re study, prospective study where they're collecting ctDNA. So we'll, we'll probably have more information from that in the future. All right, we're a little past the hour, so I have, I'll ask this one last question, which I think is a really good one from Dr. Chang. Um, and uh, he asked, how do you envision improving the management of T-cell lymphoma entities that are particularly rare? Uh, you know, some of the ones even that you didn't, um, weren't able to hit on in today's talk. So do you think um, the community at large would be able to design decent sized trials for some of these more rare subtypes? Yeah, that's tough, but I, um, yeah, I, I, you can see, I apologize, I went, a little bit over, <laughs> yeah. Because and that's even selecting down to the nodal subtypes. Um, I mean, we already are doing that to some extent. Um, hep I'll just quickly ream off some of the uh, what we're doing. Uh, hepatosplenic T cell lymphoma. Um, nobody's using CHOP anymore, and we're going. Most people are going straight to even an allo. Um, subcutaneous PTCL. We recognize that the alpha beta subtype, they do very well with immunomodulatory agents. So we're uh, avoiding chemotherapy. NK T cell lymphoma has its own um, treatment algorithm with, you know, toss out CHOP, bring in asparaginase. Um, I think EDL is, you know, enteropathy, enteropathy type T cell lymphoma. Uh, that is also, that one's an interesting one we need to do better in. Um, it is CD30 positive. Um, you know, those patients were included in echelon one, but there was only one patient on the arm. So it would be, I think it would be really interesting to see more data with chet BV in that entity. I would still favor transplanting in that group as well. Um, I think the monomorphic um, intestinal T cell lymphoma, I, don't, I do not know what to do with those. Those are hard. They're CD30 negative. Uh, I think they require a dose intensive, like maybe a CHO up and transplant. But I, I do think it is possible to study these. We just, we obviously, we need to uh, pull together as a community because they are rare, but we've shown in the last, um, you know, 10 years or more that we can do trials in peripheral T cell lymphomas with, with collaboration. And the only way we're gonna move forward is if we, if we join and do that so we, that we learn what the best treatments are. Well, thank you again. Uh, I know several of us are looking forward to the opportunity to meet uh, individually with you and looking forward to opportunities for future collaborations between you and our program here. And I again want to thank Dr. Curry and the family and your family for your generosity and want to reiterate the impact that this gift has had on the development of our program over the last several years. Uh, before we finish up, I'd just like to turn it back over to Dr. Curry who'd like to say a few words uh, and to conclude our session today. 
Thank you. This was uh, again for a wonderful, uh, informative lecture. I must say that even I get something out of it, given my limited knowledge. This was wonderful. Barbara, can is this possible to ping Surinder's three other very important people in his life? Can you ping my daughter, my son, and my brother? Is yeah. it possible? You mean, when you say ping, you mean unmute them? Un or just ping them on the screen or unmute them? Okay, we'll do it. Uh, we're, we're all on, Ma. Okay. Oh, okay. <laughs> we this can is... see, you have to have it in gallery view, which is a, okay. like, that's like AP level Zoom. So I don't oh, know if it is, it is. we're gonna it, get there. But... I freely admit I'm, I'm not even at the basic level. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we're, we're we just, we'll, we'll just share in mom's thanks um, to everybody at Winship. And uh, yet again, it's it's sort of hard to believe this is already the sixth annual lecture. I think it's a testament to my mother who uh, in over four decades of partnership with my father always knew exactly what to do and could not have honored his legacy better than she does with this lecture. And uh, we couldn't have gotten better care than we did at the hands of Dr. Loniel and everybody at Winship. And it's you know tremendous for us to see that this lecture has in fact yielded the fruits we hoped it would. And just thank you for, for coming, for being here and for helping us honor our father uh, the way that uh, we, we can. Barbara, can you ping my son? He's right there. He's, He's right here. right there. <laughs> I don't see him, but. I can't mute him. Right, there he goes, you're okay. on mute. I'm on mute, I'm here, mom. Okay, okay. <laughs> yeah, so, so am I. So I've lost the screen. Uh-oh. They're uh -oh. all there. You're there? Yes. She's taking on attendance. <laughs> no, but this has been wonderful. Uh, thank you, Dr. Savage, uh, Dr. Loniel, the, the Winship staff. Uh, this is just creating more knowledge, adding more knowledge, and helping mankind in a small way. And uh, certainly makes me remember my brother-in-law who, as you have guessed, was just an incredible human being, uh, professionally as well as personally. Uh, one could not have asked for a better brother-in-law. And I'm grateful to all of you, uh, and particularly my sister, for, for orchestrating this in his memory. So I just my, say thank you. And uh, Saurabh is there somewhere. Um, Barbara, I... I would like Dr. Savage to be, can I see her and show her that? <laughs> we can say. Dr. Savage, thank oh, you yeah. so much. Uh, we have a plaque and I don't even know if you can see it. I, I can just, see it, yeah. Uh, you can see it. And this is uh, to thank you and appreciate oh, so nice. and uh, for honoring us by your lecture. And the picture in the plaque is of River Ganges as it comes down from the Himalayan mountains to two of the holiest cities in India. And the surrender loved uh, River Ganges. So this just symbolically is his love. And thank you very much. We will be mailing it to you, but we will hope to see you sometimes in Atlanta in future. I would love that. I, I am sad that I missed uh, meeting you the night the dinner the night before, which I, I think it's great to have those, uh, you know, personal conversations. And I, I'd like to plant a seed that you have a Prairie lectureship um, anniversary and invite all your prior speakers back. <laughs> oh, that's a wonderful idea. Isn't that a great idea. <laughs> thank you so much. Barbara will mail it to you. I will request Barbara to help us get it to you. Uh, thank, thank you, Dr. Loniel. Thank you, everybody. And we, we will uh, look forward to seeing you again sometime. Yeah. I think Thanks I think again. I appreciate it. Savage December, Ash is in Atlanta. That was ah, is it? This yep. year? Oh, next year. Yep. Oh, wonderful. You mean 2022? Nope. This year? This year. Oh, fabulous. Yeah. Oh, okay, well, let's see. If the border's open, I'm there. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. This was, thank you, Barbara. Thank you, Jennifer, Julie for your collective talent in helping us with this. Yes, it's been a pleasure. Every year has been a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Loniel, as usual. Bye-bye, <laughs> thanks again. Bye. You all have a safe Bye. weekend. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Cohen, for pulling it together. <laughs> oh, of course, our pleasure. <laughs>